it's, uh, it's about time now that uh, join. We've got a good crowd in here. I want to welcome everyone. My name is Melvin McInnes, and uh, I have the pleasure of being the director of the Heinz Prechter Bipolar Research uh, Program. Uh, the Prechter Program is named in honor of Heinz Prechter. Heinz Prechter lived with bipolar disorder. He was an amazing, successful businessman here in uh, Michigan. And sadly, Heinz Prechter died by suicide uh, approximately 20 years ago. His family established the Heinz Prechter Bipolar Research Program here at the University of Michigan. And our mission is to work together with our community, with uh, the researchers here at the University of Michigan, with those with lived experience, to identify mechanisms that cause bipolar disorder, develop programs that help us understand the trajectory and the course of the illness uh, better in order to attempt to be able to predict outcomes and, and just simply understand the illness uh, better. So that's our mission. But most importantly, <clears throat> our vision, which I love visions, our vision is that everyone that lives with bipolar disorder can live a productive and fulfilling life. And this is what this evening is all about. It's about living well with bipolar disorder. And so we have on, uh, on the agenda this evening, we have a presentation by just an amazing researcher, Dr. Sarah Sperry, whom I introduce in a moment, and then a panel discussion with uh, individuals that live with bipolar disorder either as individuals themselves or family members that uh, have bipolar disorder. But before we begin, I want, just want to take a moment and reflect on the tragedy that happened in our community uh, this past week. Uh, and I'm talking about the tragedy at Michigan State University. Michigan State is in our community. Together, we are all Michigan. And the tragic events that happened this past week touch us all. And it's very humbling to think of students that are in an environment of learning and growth and development living through this experience. I can't imagine what, it'd be, what, would, what it would be like. Students that have grown up in a culture where violence occurs in the schools and the communities, it's really, really, really unacceptable that we, that, we, that we have to live like this. So as we support our colleagues and our friends in our communities, I also challenge ourselves that we need to support our legislative branch, our legislative individuals that represent us in the government, that they need our support as well. And they need our support to know where we stand, and what our views are in this, in this regard. And we need to help them, enable them, charge them, commission them, whatever it is to help resolve, change these, change the situation to help us resolve these challenges that we have in our community. So our thoughts, thoughts go out to our friends, our colleagues that, have, that lived through these experiences. Now, back to bipolar disorder and, and our program tonight, the Prechter program is now in its 18th year. Uh, we have been working diligently through the pandemic. I think we recruited uh, over 50 individuals into our study. We have, on average, uh, between 900 and 1,000 individuals that live with bipolar disorder that contribute every other month throughout the year information that helps us understand the trajectory and the patterns of bipolar disorder. We're so grateful uh, to these individuals and, and we work with them on a daily basis to help, to help ourselves and help others understand and, and work with bipolar disorder. Now, in thinking about this evening and thinking about how to understand bipolar disorder, I'm reminded of a quote by by a, a, a renowned physicist, Richard Feynman, who's a Nobel laureate. And Richard Feynman said that, that if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And so this, a similar thing can be said about bipolar disorder. If you really think you understand bipolar disorder, do you really understand bipolar disorder? I have been working with individuals who live with bipolar disorder for the past 30 years, 
then constantly learning something new each and with you know with each and every individual that I work with. And I emphasize that helping people with bipolar disorder is a collaboration. It's a collaboration between the individual who lives with the disorder, the family members who are helping, and the care provider who is advising as to strategic plans and things that, that, um, that we can do. All too often, we neglect a fundamental element of humanity as it relates to bipolar disorder, and that is living well. Remember, our vision is that every individual lives a healthy and fulfilling life. And so we're here this evening to talk about that and to help us get some in, develop more insights into how others live well with bipolar disorder, what we mean by wellness, and how we start to approach this particular problem. So it gives me tremendous pleasure, tremendous pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Sperry, a clinical psychologist who joined us uh, um, just about a year and a half ago. And it's just been a dynamic force in our team here. And we're so pleased and honored that she's, uh, that she's uh, joining us. Dr. Sperry delights in working with individuals with bipolar disorder and works on our clinic and, and, and the, the psychotherapy strategies uh, with uh, in helping individuals find the path forward with healing and, and living uh, well. Uh, so Dr. Sperry did her PhD at the University of Illinois uh, and, and a fellowship at Vanderbilt University and joined the Prechter program in September of 2021. And so with that, Dr. Sperry, I'll turn it over to you and thank you for joining us this evening and we so look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Melvin. I'm gonna share my screen now have a little bit of a presentation for you all. Okay. All right, so I'm honored to be here today to speak to you about wellness and bipolar disorder. As a clinical psychologist and a researcher focused on bipolar disorder, this is a topic I think about a lot. And I'm just humbled to be in a program where this is a now a conversation that we are taking outside the walls of our offices and sharing with other people in the greater community. Um, this idea that we need to understand and pay attention to what it looks like to live well with bipolar disorder. So I'm going to start off with a somewhat provocative sentence. Health is more than the absence of disease. So again, health is more than the absence of disease. Yet in so many cases in the clinic, in our, oh no, sorry about that. <laughs> in our clinic and our research practices, we focus on what's not going well. We ask questions about symptom severity and functional impairment. And we equate improvements in these domains to success in terms of treatment. And sometimes we think about the absence of symptoms or impairment as wellness. But again, health is more than the absence of disease. Why aren't we also measuring what's going well for our research participants, for our patients, for our family members? Why aren't we paying attention to thriving, wellness, well-being, quality of life, life satisfaction? You can call it whatever you want, but in an essence, it's, it's the opposite of, of disease. How are people living well? And there's an increased effort in training programs and research practices to better capture well-being, and that's a really exciting and important start. But I would argue we have a long way to go. And I'm gonna give you some examples today that I think highlight uh, the advances that we need to make and conversations that we need to start. So I'm gonna start by giving some examples of how we might, uh, going backwards, think about well being and wellness and how we measure it with the type of structured data that we get when somebody comes into the clinic at Michigan Medicine for an appointment with a provider in the bipolar clinic or enrolls into one of our research studies. I'm gonna start with this word thriving, okay? This to me perhaps seems like the most positive form of wellness that you could be reaching for. 
I think we all want to thrive. When I do a deep dive into the literature to try to understand factors that promote thriving and bipolar disorder, I'm most often faced with this definition or this way of measure, measuring thriving, a lack of symptoms for a sustained period of time. Okay, so again, this is, this is focused on symptoms. This is focused on the disease. Let's look at this figure. So in my clinic and in many of the clinics at Michigan Medicine, when you check into your appointment, you get to fill out some questionnaires. If you're coming to our bipolar clinic, you'll fill out questionnaires on your depression symptoms, which here for this hypothetical individual is plotted in blue. You'll be asked questions about manic symptoms, which are plotted in red, and you'll also get asked about anxiety plotted in green. And as somebody's clinician or as the researcher who's trying to understand how somebody's doing, I like to look at this over time. Now, if we take that definition I just gave of thriving and we look at this hypothetical client, we might say that during this period of time from months 12 to 16 that they're thriving because they have an absence of depressive, manic, or anxiety symptoms. Keep this in mind for later. Let's take another uh, word that sometimes people use to talk about wellness or well being, and that's health related quality of life. This is another term our field uses to try to measure how somebody's doing. Now, better quality of life sounds great, right? It's a positive thing. But when we look at the measures of quality of life and how people are asked about this, they're again rooted in disease. With the definition most commonly, patient outcomes focused on deficits in functioning. I'm going to give you an example. Here's a common measure that's used clinically and in research settings and often is used as a proxy for quality of life. Example items are, because of my mental illness, my ability to work is impaired. Because of my mental illness, my home management is impaired. Because of my mental illness, my social leisure activities are impaired, so on and so forth. And so it's obvious if you're answering the, these questions that a high score would indicate that you're having a lot of impairment. But I asked, does a low score on a measure like this mean someone isn't living well? So let's go back to that patient chart I just showed you. I've now added this yellow line, which reflects the scores on that measure I just showed you. And so what we look at here is that I can see that as depression and mania and anxiety symptoms bottom out, quality of life is improved. And this is important to see, it's useful. It's good to know that as symptoms track down, there's less impairment. But what if I ask my client about what's going on during this period? Maybe they're having some mild symptoms of depression and mania, or maybe they're having some mild to moderate symptoms of anxiety and some impairment in, in their functioning. But what if my client tells me, well, over that month, I was going to Pottery Weekly, and this is my activity that I use to de-stress and be creative. I've been spending time with my friends and family at least once a week, which is an improvement for me. And I feel like I have purpose because I joined a NAMI group and I'm helping um, you know, other peers who have bipolar disorder. And I also reached my exercise goal of, of walking three times a week. Now, I ask them that again during this period of thriving where there's an absence of symptoms. And now my client tells me, I'm too busy at work to go to pottery or spend time with family and friends right now. I'm feeling burnt out and overwhelmed and I don't have time to exercise. But remember, based on the definition before, if thriving is the absence of symptoms, this doesn't sound like someone who's thriving. So I hope this, these examples just get your mind running, thinking about how measuring well-being and 
what it means to have purpose in life or live well day to day does not necessarily match where somebody's symptoms are at or where somebody's level of functional impairment due to those symptoms are at. So let's see what people living with bipolar disorder say. Over the last five years, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, or DBSA, along with the Milken uh, Institute for uh, Philanthropy, um, initiated a supporting wellness campaign. They engaged 6,405 individuals with lived experience, about two-thirds of those with bipolar disorder, the rest with unipolar depression. They sent them surveys and they did smaller focus groups. And the goal of this initiative was to ask people, what are your wellness priorities? What does wellness mean to you? And what do you think the priorities for research and bipolar and depressive disorders should be going forward? I'm gonna show you two statistics here that jump out to me that really highlight what I just showed in that last slide. Of those 6,405 individuals, only 17% identified reducing their symptoms of bipolar disorder as an important part of their wellness. 17%. 76% reported that their health care and their mental health care was focused solely on minimizing symptoms. So we've got uh, a mismatch here. We're, we've got people telling us that a lack of symptoms is not how they define wellness, but all of our treatments are focused on reducing symptoms. This is a problem. So how do people start to define their own wellness? How can we learn from how people define wellness to potentially improve our treatments? So let me take you through this figure. On the left, we had the most, the 10 most common things that people said when defining wellness for them. And again, these are 6,400 people with bipolar disorder and depression. On the right, those percentages represent the percent of people who indicated that this was their highest priority for wellness. So our top score was ability to be independent or act according to my own will. In the focus groups, when people were asked, you know, can you tell us more about that? Common themes were, I want to be able to be present and be in control of my emotions and my decisions. The second most common answer was purpose in life, which most people defined in terms of playing a specific role or function in relation to somebody else. So I'm a parent, I'm a child, I'm a friend, I'm a sister, I'm a spouse but also highlighted in terms of general connections to other people and getting purpose out of making a difference through actions, whether small or large. Other big hitters were just getting through the day, doing my daily tasks, self-acceptance, having a calm and relaxed presence, having follow through on ideas and intentions, having a sense of influence over the events in my life, having positive relations with others, and personal growth. And so when I saw these 10 answers, I was further convinced that a lack of symptoms or impairment in work and social areas is not capturing these types of deep internal feelings that people have related to whether they are living well. And so I can see people, maybe they're de experiencing depressive symptoms, but they still are following through on ideas. They still feel purpose in life. They still feel like they can act according to their own will. And so we need to start measuring these things separately. The next statistics that I found really interesting that were an outcome of this project was the percentages of people that highlighted anything related to, to mood in their definition of wellness. 4% indicated that having generally good mood was important to them. 4% uh, 
highlighted an absence of negative mood as part of their definition of wellness. 9% indicated that contentment or acceptance was um, an aspect of wellness. 2% for positive outlook, 4% for stability, and 2% for feeling normal. So these are really small percentages of that overall population, with the most common aspect being contentment or acceptance. Two things that we do not measure in the clinic um, and very rarely measure in research. The last stats I wanna highlight for you from this project is that aspects of wellness fluctuate. So they ask people, you know, how often do you feel like you're having changes in your wellness? How often do you th see the activities that you're doing or the ways you feel about the world change and impact your wellness? And the overwhelming majority indicated that their wellness fluctuates day to day, which highlights this is something that we can measure over time and see how it changes see when it's going well, when it's not going well. So to me, these results highlight that one, we're not, we're not measuring wellness in our current uh, measures, that wellness is an important priority to people with bipolar disorder, that it does fluctuate over time, and it is not the absence of symptoms. So how do we move forward? How do we measure wellness alongside our traditional assessments, which are also important? Well, I'm excited to tell you about a new initiative that the Prector program started to try to help move that needle forward. How do we measure and address wellness, living well with bipolar disorder? I'm gonna highlight the steps that we've taken thus far. And we're doing so through the initiation of the Prector Program Learning Health System or LHS. So what is a learning health system? It's when organizations or networks continuously adapt using data to generate knowledge, to engage stakeholders and people with lived experience and implement behavior change to transform practice. We have this learning cycle that you see in front of you, and this is the framework for doing this in a learning health system. So let me tell you a little bit about each of these pieces. First, we have data and knowledge. Many improvement efforts in health-related fields focus on gathering data and learning something from that data, but so often the learning stops there. Our goal with the Proctor Learning Health System is to keep that loop going. We want to harness the knowledge we learn from data to actually implement change in our clinical and research practices. So that second piece, knowledge to performance, we're effectively taking the information that we learn and apply it to implement change and transform healthcare. We can do this through training, implementation of new processes, new measures, new technologies, and changes to the process and environment of care. And lastly, we learn from those lessons of implementing something new. We use that data to inform and refine the next cycle. And this cycle continues going over and over again. And I want to stop to acknowledge Dr. Alexandra Vinson here, who is faculty in the Department of Learning Health Sciences at the University of Michigan, who has partnered with the Prector program to develop this LHS and has been um, just such an important part of the work that I'm going to be sharing with you today. So the first step in creating a learning health system is developing a learning community. This community should engage stakeholders with diverse experiences and opinions. And there's an explicit goal in the learning communities to include individuals with lived experience. This is a critical piece. And we're so lucky in the Prector program to have so many partners with lived experience that take this journey with us. So about seven months ago, we formed our first learning community. 
which includes individuals with lived experience, clinicians, researchers, administrative staff, trainees, and family members of those with lived experience. We started meeting every three weeks. The next step of a learning health community is to identify the health problem of interest. You can't just start this cycle without having a goal. So our learning community identified one of its first priorities, which is to measure wellness and bipolar disorder. Now, what have we done so far? The first step was capturing the landscape. We got feedback from patients, families, researchers, and providers on the measurement of wellness, whether that's something that they think is important to measure, whether it's something that they feel like is being captured in their care or the research. We then assembled data. We identified and collected existing wellness measures or measures that um, things like quality of life, life satisfaction, um, social and health functioning. We went through these scales. We went through studies on wellness and bipolar disorder. We went through the DBSA survey that we were just talking about. And we all did that together. And we came to the conclusion that we were not happy with any existing measures. So we made the decision to design a new measure. So our learning community has been co-designing this measure of wellness to be used in research and clinical settings. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the priorities of this measure that we want to develop. First, we want this measure to be individualized. We want to ask people to provide examples of things that they do when they're living well. So we ask people, what promotes well-being for you? Give us some examples. So we might be looking for things like spending time with my dog. These are all true things for my well-being. Spending time with my dog, traveling and being in beauty and nature, or pottery. That's my stress relief, that example before. So we want people to be able to tell us, what, what things do you need to do to feel well? We want it to be a measure that can be repeated as often as once per week so we can track those fluctuations that they highlighted in the DBSA survey. We want to include both quantitative and qualitative components. And what I mean by this is we want number rankings of how people are doing, but we also want you to provide text so we can really understand your experience. We want it to be able to be administered in research and clinical settings. We want an overall number that we can use to rate wellness over the last month. And we want it to be simple enough that it can be done alone, or it can be done in concert with a family member, caregiver, or provider. So we are hopefully about two meetings away from having uh, our wellness measure complete. What do we do with it then? We move to the next stage where we take action. We're going to give it to participants in the Prector program, we're going to give it to people in the clinic, and we're going to ask the important questions of, is this helpful? Can you do it? How long does it take you? How would it change the clinical workflow for a provider to give this measure and learn from it? Do people think it's going to be helpful? And then we'll use that data to iteratively improve our measure, understand how it affects our research studies, our care systems, and then learn a lot more about wellness and bipolar disorder. So I'm excited for this new initiative. I'm excited for this work we've been doing as a, a learning community. I wanna highlight how unique it is that we're doing this alongside people with lived experience. So often measurement design happens in these ivory towers of, of people who are experts in an area, but but we're all experts and all of our voices need to be heard in order to make sure this measure does what we want it to do. So with that, I wanna say thank you so much to the Prector Learning Community who's put in the work to start our learning health system, which was made possible through a generous gift from Raymond and Jane Cracciolo and, the Bipo and donations to the Bipolar Research Innovation Fund. 
And I'm really excited for the next part of our evening, which is a panel discussion where many of our members of our learning community are here tonight and are going to help us learn more about what it looks like to live well with bipolar disorder. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sperry. That was terrific. And, and I'm so glad that you talked about wellness and, and, and the learning circle and, and how we are in the process of learning together about how we can all live more fulfilling and healthy lives uh, and, 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 and measure it and find and, and follow it and, and, and give, give ourselves feedback on how things are going. So I want to shift to the panel discussion part of the evening, and I want to welcome our lived experience individuals that have, uh, have taken time in their busy lives to join us this evening and share with us some of their experiences. And I'm just going to uh, start just by uh, asking uh, you to introduce yourselves, and uh, I, and I will just call you out on the on the screen as I see you. Let's go, Wendy, for example. You want to kick off with the, your introduction? Sure. Um, my name is Wendy, and I was diagnosed with bipolar one in two thousand six, in my late twenties. Um, I had a depressive episode followed by a manic episode that led to hospitalization and. I uh, was in denial of my diagnosis at first, um, believing that I just had a bad reaction to an antidepressant, uh, which I later learned can be a sign of someone who has bipolar um, to have a reaction. And didn't really believe in the diagnosis until I had another manic episode a year later. That's when I started to accept that I did have this diagnosis, but had a fear that I wouldn't live a normal life. Um, really internalized the stigma of the illness. And although it took many years to find the right combination of medications, and I still occasionally struggle with depression and anxiety, I would say overall, I would consider myself living well with um, bipolar. And I, um, you know, I'm very fortunate in my life. I'm able to work full time in a fast paced position at the University of Michigan have a very active social life, able to develop close friendships and relationships and enjoy time with family and friends. I have a strong foundation at home. I recently became a mother. Uh, we adopted our daughter recently. Um, and so I am a tired parent, <laughs> but mm. I feel fortunate that mm. I wasn't able to, I didn't get into mania or severe depression um, when she was born. So I feel very fortunate in that way. Um, I also love to volunteer with nonprofits and I'm a community theater actress, so I stay busy, which keeps me well. And I take joy in sharing my story, um, and being open about my diagnosis in a way to say, yeah, you can live a full life with a mental condition, um, like bipolar. And, uh, one of the things that I kind of think about when I like to tell my story is to look at what you know, to say what to my younger self, um, who had that fear that I wouldn't live a normal life, that you can have a normal life to the extent that anyone can, that bipolar doesn't have to be a limitation, and that you can excel and have a good um, stability. And it it means different things at different times. But overall, I would say um, this is very exciting to be here and to to talk about this kind Perfect. of issue. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us this evening, uh, Wendy. It's just our honor to have you have you here amongst us. Jack, uh, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Thank you. Yes, yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Melvin. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Jack. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar 1 in December of 2012 um, when I was 19 uh, while I was in college. So um, I'm now 29 about 10 years later. Um, and I would say I very much am living well with bipolar disorder. I would say it hasn't been a um, linear path uh, to accepting my diagnosis and figuring out my own recipe with my day-to-day -day living. Um, but I feel like over the last 10 years, I've 
put a lot of good things in place. Um, I consider myself to be, um, you know, I've accepted my diagnosis and I'm on the right path and living well. And I pride myself on going to work every day and socializing every day and staying active every day. Um, and just putting myself in a position to succeed um, living with bipolar disorder. Oh, terrific. And uh, we're going to be having just a general kind of panel discussion to talk about strategies. And I really liked your word there, uh, you know, the word recipe, you know, and sort of a pathway forward. Uh, Sarah, do you want to uh, go next, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah. Um, I connected with the Proctor Center and um, this learning health system group via um, my brother, who has a bipolar diagnosis, um, in looking for resources for him and going through the struggles of him being hospitalized and trying to figure out what we could do um, to help get him stabilized and help prevent this in the future. Um, just kind of opened up this, this whole world to me. Um, I am super excited to be a part of this initiative because um, as anyone who has a loved one who struggles with this disease or any mental health issue knows, the um, shortcomings of the present system can be really, really frustrating to navigate. Um, and I consider myself and my family and my brother are very lucky in terms of our resources and our ability to navigate the system. So it's it's um, difficult to imagine how uh, those with with without those sorts of resources um, could maintain hope in this in this situation. So being a part of this panel has been really um, cathartic for me in trying to use what I've learned and share with others. Um, and uh, also has just really helped me to better understand and be a better support for my brother. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. And we're so pleased that you're a part of the panel. So uh, welcome. And uh, Mike, uh, Yes. it's uh, up to you now. Yeah, thank you for having me, uh, Dr. McGinnis. Uh, so I've lived with bipolar one and general anxiety as well as uh, depression for like 40 years. <clears throat> I have a very close connection to, to the Heinz Prechter, uh, uh, really the, the whole um, the clinic. I actually was, I worked for Heinz and I, I used to drive him around uh, when we were uh, on the Toyota team. Uh, so after graduation from uh, high school, I swam competitively at Michigan State and uh, I was very much a moody type of person and stabilization wasn't something I was very good at. But um, I swam, so I put a lot of effort and time into the water and that actually helped me out tremendously. After moving past that, I spent quite a few years um, in the sales arena, and when I once I was in the sales arena, uh, quotas, you know, grew exponentially. So I was older when I was diagnosed. So I was forty-four years of age when I was actually officially diagnosed, and um, and that was in two thousand and twelve when I had to uh, proactively go into St. Mary's. Uh, psych ward and uh, for eight days and then have an outpatient uh, experience for about 35. So again, I had to understand my diagnosis better. I had to do all the reading uh, about bipolar one, uh, obviously over time. And I joined a group called uh, NAMI, which is the National um, Alliance of Mental Illness, which was a very important piece of my treatment plan. And uh, again, it's kind of been my backstop. Terrific. Thank you very much. And so one of the themes that I'm picking up on this evening is, is, uh, is, is activities. But, but first, I want to, uh, to really just uh, state forthwith that you know, the evening, we're going to spend on, on focusing on wellness. And, and so the questions that have uh, the wonderful people have sent in, we're going to kind of put them in the context of wellness. And so the, as Dr. Sperry pointed out in her wonderful presentation, you know, too, all too often in, in psychology and psychiatry and in medicine in general, we focus on symptoms and signs of illness and rather, uh, rather than focusing on, well, how can we help you live better 
and more fulfilled. Uh, one of the themes, uh, uh, Dr. Sperry, that you brought out was activities. I noticed you shared with us uh, your pottery uh, hobby, uh, and that's a good, really uh, a brilliant pottery that you're, you're doing there. And so I'm interested to hear about, uh, uh, about activities uh, that people like to do, and, I, and, and, um, and that's, and so who, uh, your favorite activity, so you know, Jack, what do you, what do you, what, what do you like to do in, in life as we know it? So I'm uh, very active athletically. I play a few different sports. Um, I have gravitated towards racket sports of all things. So tennis um, is kind of the sport I played growing up. So I still, I still use that um, socially. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it's very helpful. It gives me a purpose. Um, it gives me a workout and it gives me people to be social with in a healthy way. Um, I'm also active in golf and uh, snowboarding in the winter, which kind of also give me similar positives um, to look for. So I'm um, very active year round and it gives me something to look forward to and something to strive for. All right, well, I'm picking up on the theme of looking forward to and, uh, and, and Mike, what, what do you look forward to in your day? You know, I, I, I try to uh, look forward to, you know, making somebody smile. That's probably the most important thing I can do, because I think there's just not enough people uh, in this world to make someone smile. So I try to just show a smile to anybody that I come across. Hmm. Now, um, very often, you know, was, uh, you know, I've talk to people who are perhaps not in the best of moods and, and they say, well, he was smiling at me and it really kind of annoyed me and, and that. And so, Wendy, how do we, how do we, you know, shift things around to get, to get somebody to smile or to get, you know, to bring out the positive things of, uh, of people? How, uh, what, what is our, what is kind of a strategy there? Well, I think that, um, first of all, validating where somebody is, um, to be able to uh, first acknowledge that someone might not feel like smiling right away, and that's okay, you know, um, but to be able to sit with somebody and be there with them and model your own uh, positivity, but not in a mm, toxic way, I guess. So. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, you know, and I, and I, you know, the, the, the positive nature that Mike describes, it, it's, it's infectious. I just, you know, kind of felt, uh, you know, just it's like smiling, just hearing, uh, hearing him say that. Sarah, I, in terms of like interacting with family members, I know that uh, one of the challenges that family members have is how do we, you know, bring out the best in our family uh, members that are perhaps not at their best moment? I think um, that I have learned a lot on that front. Um, being toxically positive can is usually I've learned coming from something more that I need than what um, my my brother needs in my case. Uh, and I think sometimes um, again joining the person where they're at and maybe deciding you know asking do do you want me to just listen or do you want me to come up with solutions i'm a fixer i'm going to try to throw a solution at anything that comes my way and sometimes that's not what the person needs and i think also remembering i think when you're a caregiver in a position of, of giving care it's it's sometimes you um preclude yourself from from needing that other person right your relationship with that person changes and everyone needs to be needed so another thing i found is that that has really i think i certainly helped me but also i think helped my brother in times when i've said I i'm really having a hard time with all of this right now like what can we do to support each other like i need some support from you too in this which is just another way to sort of join the person where they're at yeah. That's, that's 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 terrific, and I know Mike, you're involved heavily uh, with the NAMI uh, group, and, and and just sort of taking up the theme that Sarah sure. talked about in the context of support. Uh, what is the secret to success in NAMI? I mean, NAMI is a spectacular organization and provides yeah. a lot of support for so many people. How do it, they do the it? Line, the bottom line is NAMI provides hope. That is, if you want a if you want a one sentence uh, summary of what the organization gives, it's hope. 
And it's not a organization that needs to uh, raise money or it really provides many different ways, advocacy, support, and of course, uh, it gives the, uh, the, the, the ability to uh, provide wellness and many different things, support groups that we offer. And this goes throughout the entire state of Michigan. We all have mm -hmm. various numbers, education, we educate. Mm -hmm. For free. Uh, all the classes we have are all free. People that have family members that, of course, that live with somebody who has a health, uh, a mental health condition. And then, of course, we were advocating for everybody at the state of Michigan, so in the legislature. Yeah. So we do all that. Terrific. And uh, one of the things that that uh, that you mentioned that you know is education and hope. And Dr. Sperry, I know a lot of what you do in your work in psychotherapy is you know is education and, and finding pathways forward. And there's been a number of questions here um, uh, um, on the panel about how do we how do we reach a family member or how do we reach someone who is perhaps not in the right place to, to really. Um, deal with, grapple with, accept, or whatever the right word would be their 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 condition, uh, and, and at the same time provide care and, and understanding. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it speaks exactly to what I was talking about. Is that so often care is about the diagnosis and a symptom and picking a treatment for that symptom. But when people aren't ready to hear the diagnosis or people aren't ready to identify with it and, and jump right into a therapy, I view it as my job to find that little grain of, of salt that we have in common. And so it, it is more about wellness. So, you know, when's the last time you were feeling well? What was, what was going on for you? Um, maybe they tell me that, you know, oh, if I could just sleep again. Like I remember when I was getting enough sleep, I was like energized and I was going about my day and, and there's my grain of salt, right? I can ignore bipolar disorder, but I can say, well, let's get you sleeping better. Like let's focus on me and I'm getting you to a place where you have the energy to do the things you want. Or it could be as simple as if we have a measure like this, sitting with somebody and saying, what makes you happy? What makes you feel fulfilled? What gives you purpose in life, right? And and helping people recognize that there are those things, even when right. they're in the, the midst of despair and think there's there are times in your life when when things were probably going well and I can be supportive and try to help you get there when your brain is just trying to feed you all of the negatives of everything that's going on right now. So it's our yeah. job to help people get there. Get there, yeah. On the ground, even if they don't want to accept the diagnosis or take medicine, these are, these are strategies yeah. that we can use and family members can use. Yeah, so I, I, there's one... one particular phrase that you use that is a uh, that, uh, that I that I I'm, uh, I'm noticing getting there you said a couple of getting there getting there you know getting to the the place where things are well and so there's been a couple of questions about um so when a when a loved one or a family member or friend is there if you will that are doing well so I'm interested you know in Wendy and in, in sort of maintaining that uh, balance and working with your family members you know to uh, you are to have the family help, but not be overly vigilant. The one one question came about is eggshelling, for example. When do we do we walk on eggshells? You know, watch. I don't want to. I want. I don't want to set them up. Help us. Help us, or enlighten us, or help us understand a little bit more about how this process works for you, and sort of working with your family and keeping a balance in that. Staying well, think, there, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I think that having the um, the independence to you know make the decisions for myself, um, I think it's a hard balance for family members to want to help somebody, but they can't. They don't want to step on the other person's toes. But um, I think for maintaining wellness. Um, being honest and open, but also um, really respecting that the individual knows themselves the best 
Um, and they, you can be there for however, however they, they need you, but not, um, you know, you don't want to overstep or, um, I think it's just being able to, to know for me, as someone living with bipolar, mm -hmm. knowing that I have my family and friends to support me, but I'm ultimately the one that's making the decisions. Right, it's a delicate balance, and 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 this, and this goes back to the to the point that I was making that you know if you truly understand if you think you truly understand bipolar disorder you probably don't truly understand bipolar disorder. And uh, Jack, I, I'd I'd love to hear from you as to how you've negotiated that balance of um, you know getting family support, but keeping or, you know keeping your own space and that kind of a thing. Yeah, I think it's I think it's extremely important to be in control of your own your own deal. Um, also, while knowing you do have a support system um, when needed, I think I've been, I'm extremely lucky with my support system. Um, and I can reach out, I've been able to reach out to them when I've needed their support. Um, but I think being in control of my own schedule um, and, you know, my own day-to-day -day life and controlling the things that I can, can control has been extremely helpful for my mood. And then being able to reach out when needed um, has been helpful. So I think it's a balance of the two and not just all coming from one side or or not just me shutting the door and saying, I'm gonna do it mm -hmm. all. Um, I, think, I think it has to be a two-way street. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, phenomenal. And so, Sarah, I'm, I'm interested. You know, so uh, Jack pointed out the, you know, reaching out and and being helpful, and and then at the same time, you know, having that identity and and being in control. Uh, speak to us about the struggles that they, you know, of a of a family member trying to negotiate those rough seas as to knowing, you know, when to reach out and when to be helpful and and um, and then that. It's, it seems to me a very challenging place. yeah i think it's a it's a journey it's a work in progress always um autonomy is important to everyone uh and over responsibility is something that i struggle with i think just in general um so it's i think that i'm fortunate i guess in my specific experience that um my brother did get to a place and is in a place where he owns and acknowledges his diagnosis. And, you know, that, that makes it a lot easier. It's a lot harder when, when the person isn't in that place, because you can't necessarily feel like you can trust their autonomy in the same way. Um, but I think one thing that I have continued to try to get better at and work on is, you know, it's, it's hard, the eggshelling comment, it saw that question. And I definitely understand exactly what that person is asking about. Um, because when things are going well, you you kind of can't trust it, right? And so you don't want to always say, are you okay? No one wants to be asked if they're okay a thousand mm -hmm. times. And no one wants to ask someone if there's okay a thousand, they're okay a thousand times. But I've learned over time to be a little more direct. If I'm seeing, if I want to ask, are you okay? I've learned now that it's going to be better, more fruitful and give, and, you know, give us both the sort of ground that we need if I'm asking something more specific or if I'm saying, hey, I've noticed X, Y, or Z. Tell, can you tell me about that? Like, have you noticed that? That sort of thing. Um, and it's a little bit, I, I feel counterintuitive because, uh, you know, at first, right, you don't want to say, hey, I've noticed this very specific thing that's making me worried about you. But I think it's more frustrating to both myself and my brother to kind of ask questions obliquely and say, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of mm -hmm. dance around the issue. And so mm -hmm. um, being more direct. Being more direct is really good. Been yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Mike, you know, I know that NAMI is a resource in, in these moments of crisis. And so, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I personally, you know, for many a family member and that, I've uh, really pointed out that NAMI is a phenomenal resource. What, you know, and, and you, you mentioned NAMI provides a lot of support and help, but from a 
walk me through a, an example or kind of a hypothetical example of, uh, you know, a situation where, you know, a crisis emerges okay. and everything is unraveling and the family turns to NAMI. Okay. So let's take a step back. So when the individual is feeling good, uh, there, a plan has to be set up between mm -hmm. the individual in the family who has a mental health condition and the actual family member. That plan will dictate when the intervention might take place, uh, how far it should go, what to do next. Now, when they want to get involved with NAMI, there's a crisis involved. Uh, there is a, 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 an actual program that is actually offered to family members that doesn't cost anything. It's uh, a 10-week course called uh, Family to Family. Um, where they offer support groups. In addition, 10 weeks of uh, actual training with 10 different speakers on everything from medication to how when somebody loses a job and the relationships, talking about the legal situation, 5150. Um, you know, they basically are educating the family members on how to come through this crisis. And mm -hmm. um, again, it's something they can go right to uh, family to family on in Washtenaw, or they can go to the NAMI Metro site, which is in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County, and we do offer that program. So it's a great program. It gives a family member the ability to uh, understand what the individual is going through and what they can do to help. No, oh, terrific. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Sperry, please. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Mike. And, and I want to springboard off that and, and just talk about um this point you made about when somebody's well you have to make a plan and i think so often in our healthcare system you only get to my office door once you're really not doing well the problem with that is is that some of the therapy techniques that we teach have to be learned when you're doing well because our brains are just not functioning how they should be when we're experiencing these really strong intense um, energized states or lack of energized states, um, parts of our brain are actually not functioning as well. And so if I'm trying to teach you something when you're in the midst of a crisis, the chances that you're going to be able to take that and use that, you know, in different situations outside of my therapy office is pretty small. So I often find myself telling people like, and I know billing and whatnot, but Sometimes therapy works best when you're actually doing well. That's when you get your most learning done. You know, I'm going to teach you a skill and ask you to practice it when you're okay. And then once you get the hang of it, start using it in those crisis situations. So this idea that, um, you know, just putting it out there, the idea that you can only be in therapy if like things are not going well is, is just not true because a lot of our evidence-based strategies are best taught when you're not in those crisis states. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's so very important for people to know. And it's so important for, for, for everyone to uh, just to appreciate the importance of learning as much as you possibly can and exactly when you're well. Uh, I also wanted to to ask about you know for you know the the example I know Wendy you mentioned that you were admitted to hospital but you know what and 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 then was that in an urgent situation or that or yeah yeah I was admitted to hospitalized in an urgent situation um, mania okay did you go through the emergency room then or uh, how did that yeah, my it was my, it was actually through my family. Um, they uh, got me to get into the emergency room, and then I was hospitalized from there. So it was, you know, I thought I was fine, but really I wasn't. And so uh, it <clears throat> was through a support system of friends and family to help me right. get to that point. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the 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 important element here is is that the health systems uh, across the state and across the country they have emergency room services and so these services are meant for the urgent you know situation where someone who is in need of help now needs help now needs to be 
evaluated and, and, and assessed for the immediacy of the problem at hand. And so I just want to emphasize that that is a very important service of the healthcare systems. Unfortunately, it's a very, it's a highly subscribed uh, system and it's, it's a less than pleasant experience uh, for people to have to go through that. So that emphasizes the importance that has been brought forth here of the education of uh, you know, learning how to you know adapt, be well, and and you know come come up with uh, with, um, with with plans, and also just for for the wellness. And so, um, you know, Mike, I think you know you and I had a conversation about your interest in gardening and and yeah. and the and the meaning that. So, I'm, you know, want to turn our turn ourselves into activities that really give give meaning. Absolutely. I, uh, I just love gardening. I was, I grew up on the garden and with, uh, in South Lyon, Michigan, where my grandfather used to, everything was there. I mean, you know, cattle, chickens, he didn't, he never went to the supermarket and he taught me everything I needed to know. And I just continued that on. I almost, you know, I'm all, as well, a, a very big aficionado of the Indian, um, you know, motorcycles. So I love mm. driving motorcycles in, in, in the open air with a helmet on, with a group of uh, young men that um, we are, we're supportive of um, many different causes. You know, we support the uh, young children with autism. We support the unborn. We support um, raising money for a lot of different people, but we all have the same so, uh, single, um, you know, focus, which is we love to ride on motorcycles. But you know, oh, the, the, the whole the whole the whole thing is, you know, with with bipolar and a mental health condition, coping skills for me is going to be different. But to the next individual, for example, on the Zoom call, and it should be recognized that you that's how you live well is everybody has a coping skill that they will go to some might be pottery like uh, 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 dr sarah has talked about some people will be you know the baby they might have or whatever it might be and i see obviously a piano behind you you might like to play the piano but you know again everybody has something that they love in this world and that's what they should focus on to find that and uh and, and wendy i know that you've just recently been blessed with a uh, with something new in your your world and uh and um, managing a, a you know a baby yeah that how do you do it i'm very fortunate to have a strong support system um my husband recognizes that for um someone living with bipolar disorder the need for sleep is really really important so he manages a lot of the nighttime um wake ups. And uh, so it's been really great to have that some person that I can lean on that understands that I'm not just talking about getting sleep because I want to get sleep. It could lead me into a hospitalization if I don't get enough sleep. And so I've been very, I, I was worried when we um, became parents that I could become manic or ultra depressed or something like that. And I I didn't. And I think, you know, having that support to, with my husband, as well as friends and family that have been around have been just unbelievable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as Sarah, your passion, what do you, what do you like to do? Um, I spend a lot of time moving. Um, that's sort of my best relief. Um, I, I have a very, very busy work life. And so working the time, that's sort of my best me time. So I do a lot of walking. I do a lot of cross-country skiing in the winter. I do a lot of like yoga, Pilates type things. Like movement is really important for my own mental, mental health. Um, recently, we're talking about bipolar tonight, but I've had my own anxiety, depression struggles throughout my life. And those things really do rear, rear up if I'm, if I'm not moving enough. Mm -hmm. Um and I have no children, but I have cats that are, <laughs> that I spend my time with. I'm also a pet person. Um, and I really enjoy traveling. It's, and this is sort of the first year that I feel like my husband and I are going to get to travel in a, what will feel like we could in the before times sort of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. 
Yeah. So one of the themes that has come out in the questions that have been uh, been been offered to us or posed to us is, you know, the the you know the day to day struggles, uh, you know, in in the context of bipolar disorder. And one of them that that uh, uh, I've heard people talk about is the difficulties when depression sets in in bipolar disorder, and 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 so that can be can be difficult. I had one person describe it to me in a way that they would say, you know, says his doctor, it's just like walking through a foot and a half of water every day, you know, with every step. And it was just a, just a, uh, you know, a struggle. I thought it was a very poetic way of describing the, you know, the, the, the slog of getting, getting through the day. Uh, so Jack, uh, I just want to get to, uh, um, turn it to you, uh, to give you an, is it, does, is, is that kind of depressive, does that come over you from time or do you experience that or uh, how, how, and how, how, how do you use your activities to balance out those yeah, yeah, down I, days? Yeah, I think I, have, I definitely have down days like most people. Um, I think I've done a really good job of um, shortening the length of maybe like a, a blip, a down day um, in my weeks or in my months. Um, and one of my life mottos is keep moving. So like if I feel like I'm having a um, a depressive, maybe symptom come on, I just tell myself I need to keep moving. I can get through it. I've been through this before um, and I just need to get through it and I will. Um, and I think I, because I schedule things and plan things out in the future, I'm able to know that I have a plan in place and places to be and people to see and that sort of helps me keep moving to really to, you know kind of mitigate um any depressive signs oh yeah right uh, dr sperry does that align with uh you know your kind of approach to getting people to you know plow through the depressive phases if you will yeah um funny enough you know one of the most evidence-based strategies for depression is is really what Jack was just hinting at. We call it behavioral activation, but it's finding meaningful, purposeful, positive things that you know you like to do and scheduling them into your schedule, even if you don't feel motivated to do them, even if you don't think you're going to get pleasure, but you go out and you do them. And it could be as simple as just go take a walk around the block, go get, go even get the mail from your mailbox in, in cases of severe depression. Um, but, but the more you actually schedule those activities in, it helps your brain stop thinking that only negative things can happen. And you might catch yourself at one of, during one of those activities, having a moment of smiling or laughing and it gives you the opportunity to remember that you can feel things other than depression. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I'm going to steal G Jake's uh, Jack's motto now. And, and I feel like I should have a sign behind me that just says, just keep moving. Um, mm -hmm. Because it really, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really is critical. That's a, that's a, that, that's, that's really, uh, that's really important. Uh, and I, I thank you for bringing that up, Jack. It's really, really a great, great idea. Uh, I think the theme has been really clear here that, uh, you know, that, you know, it's, it's important, you know, keeping moving. It's important to find something that you're interested in doing. It's important to find something that you can uh, derive pleasure for. Uh, and um, all that with, uh, with, you know, with an appreciation what happens when, you know, when, when things just sort of, you know, fall through the ice, if you will, and, and things just break down, how does one, you know, kind of get, you know, get back on, get back in gear, you know, and get when, when, when you just don't feel like doing anything, when you don't feel like uh, that, and it's just a chore to even, I've heard people say, you know, you know, doctor, I just don't even feel like getting out of bed or taking a shower. How do we, how do we, how do we, get through that. Mike, how, how do you, how do we start that? Yeah. Part? yeah. So to get through it, it's just, you know, it's one step at a time. 
Mm -hmm. um, just have one goal at a time. I think a lot of it is journaling. I do a lot of journaling in my in my day, and uh, it does. I track a lot of uh, what's going on. So if I have fallen through the through the ice, and uh, again, I have to force myself. You know, like Jack and Dr. Sperry had, had talked about, you really have to keep moving. And, you know, you have to go 180 degrees opposite of how you feel, because if you don't, you're, you're giving up on yourself. And again, the things that we're doing here are just coping skills. And if you can cope um, by finding ways to do any sort of things, like whether it's smile or, um, you know, making somebody else's day better, uh, you know that that's, it's going to be, it's going to come out okay. Yeah, terrific. Thank you. So there's another theme that has emerged in the question uh, uh, um, sections that we invited people to submit uh, prior to the presentation uh, and discussion here. And that is the, the time from, you know, the first symptom to actual kind of acceptance and treatment. And so there's a period of time where individuals struggle often. And they say, you know, I don't have it. It was just as, you know, when do you generously shared with us that, you know, it's just a reaction to the medication. Uh, it's, um, um, you know, it's, it's this or it's that. We have a human capacity to explain things away. And so we say, this is that because of that, or it happened because I had an argument with my boss, or my spouse, or whomever. Struggling through that phase of time to the, you know, from the first experience to, okay, we got to take this head on and do, do something about it. Share with us, uh, you know, Jack, Wendy, you know, uh, how, what was that experience like? What did you go through? I think for me, um, like I said, you know, when I introduced myself, just the initial um, thought was denial. And then once I had my second manic episode and realized it's more of a pattern and a real diagnosis, um, you kind of go through grief. It, mm -hmm. it is a grieving process. Um, and that um, to come through the other side of it and to say, you know, this is not, this is something that I have. What are my limitations? What am I capable of? And, um, you know, what can I do to move through this? Because I think I want to live a good life and I don't think, and, and now having, you know, gone through the whole acceptance and gotten to acceptance, it's not as something bad as I thought that it once was. And that right. has to do with stigma too. Um, yeah. There's a lot of stigma. And you internalize that stigma a little bit too, even if you don't want to. And I have a background in social work and psychology and I still stick, you know, internalize the stigma for myself. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that it, it definitely uh, has an impact and uh, to just sort of say, you know, this is not a death sentence. This is uh, something that I can thrive and um, kind of going, allowing yourself and being gentle with yourself throughout that process. But it, it sounds like at the time it was a, uh, it was a, it was it was a very um, a very difficult news to to and to to take on, and it's, and it's a tra trauma, you know, in many ways. I mean, it is uh, you know, getting a diagnosis of something is is traumatic, uh, and uh, uh, and Jack, I remember you talked to me about you know, in one of our introductory you know sessions about what your twenty nine year old self would say to your nineteen year old self. I thought that was a really very, you know, I, I, you know, a really terrific metaphor. Uh, what would you say to your 19 year old self now? Um, yeah, I think about that a lot. So when I was to go off of what he was saying, when I was diagnosed, I feel like my life was just uprooted and I kind of didn't really know what to do or what to think. And the problem is, so I had a manic episode and the problem is you're in denial of the diagnosis, but you're also, um, overthinking like some of the events that happened too. So you're trying to, you're, you're young, you're trying to cope with the diagnosis, but you're also trying to cope with what happened for the two weeks when you were manic and then you're trying to put it all together. Um, but I think, you know, 10 years later, I can look and say that 
you know, it's not all gloom and doom and there is a lot to look forward to and you can live well with bipolar disorder. Um, and, you know, I've actually seen in a lot of ways I can live even better than some of my friends that, you know, don't have bipolar disorder. I feel like I can put myself in a good spot and I have a good system in place where I'm very happy and proud of what I've, where I've come from, from 10 years ago. So. Terrific. And uh, Sarah, from a, from a family member's perspective, uh, uh, you know, the impact of, of the diagnosis, you know, has uh, an effect on the family. And how, how, tell us a little bit about how, as a family, your family kind of dealt with this yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I think our family is pretty well resourced um, in that my, my father is a neuropsychologist. So we have, you know, understanding of psychology and psychiatry and some kind of experience in that realm. Um, I've struggled with anxiety and depression, so I've been treated for that. So we're, we kind of are, I think, a pretty mental health um, fluent, I guess, family. Um, and I think interestingly, actually a large part of, um, that in our lives and being open to therapy and open to, um, you know, just understanding mental health, um, came from our, my brother and I lost our mother when we were 12 and 15. And so having had that sort of experience, right. As, as, Wendy was saying, like, you go through grief, we've been through grief, like, we kind of know what what that is in a different way. Um, so I think we were better equipped than, than a lot of people in some of those ways. Um, but nobody's really equipped to, to, you know, know what to do. Um, and I think, you know, knowing that, like, like Jack was saying, I think it's 100% true, there are things um, that my brother has achieved that I wish I could like, that I, you know, know that I don't think I would have the capacity to, or things that he's achieved up, you know, beyond his peers and that sort of thing. Right. It's important to remember that. And I think some of that is, is owning the diagnosis, right? I remember my dad saying that at some point to my brother, like, you got to own this. It doesn't need to own you, but you have to own it. Um, and I think that that, was really pivotal for, for my brother, for all of us. Um, and then I think it's just been accepting that this is a journey, um, that this is a disease. It's not a, you know, it's not a health problem that has a mechanical fix, right? It's not a broken bone. It's not mm -hmm. a replaceable heart valve or something like that. Like it's the, the recipe. I love that Jack said that earlier too. Like you're, you're trying to make a recipe and you're going to have to tweak it. And sometimes this thing that worked before isn't going to work. And sometimes this thing that didn't work before is worth another shot. Um, and so I think what's been helpful to me is taking lots and lots of notes. Um, my brother has had several hospitalizations the past couple of years. And so really trying to take notes, know what he's, you know, taking, what he's on, when was he where, what does he interpret the triggers to be and keeping track of all that has been helpful for future, right? Like kind of learning everything you can um, on that front, learning the language of, of mental health, um, I think is really, I know that I have gotten information or gotten people to talk to me in these hospitals because I can speak the language a little bit more. And I can say, you know, I know this drug could have this side effect, like educating yourself as much as you can um, in the lingo, I think is really helpful um, in terms of feeling like you can, you can cope as a family member yeah. trying to get some yeah. help. Um, and I think, again, just knowing the question about eggshelling is I think the hardest thing. Um, and trusting that if you kind of take these notes and you pay attention and you, you will know when something is really off. Mm -hmm. And so it is best to just trust when things are going well, because yeah. you can't control when things are not going to go well and worrying about it all the time is just going to make the disease that much more, um, problematic. Troubling. Yeah. 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 Um, Dr. Sperry, do, do you want to comment on how we would, um, bring, you know, the, you know, the education level and, and everything, you know, forward or, you know, engaging people, how do we bring people into the, you know, as, as Sarah said, you know, the kind of the 
you know, the, the vocabulary, the, the language, the, the um, educational status of learning about and so on. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I, I think first is if, if I were to have a person come into my office who is newly diagnosed with bipolar disorder, my, my recommendation would certainly be that their family members get psychoeducation. And, and one of the evidence-based therapies for bipolar disorder is actually fam family-focused therapy. Um, and with the idea that, you know, everybody's learning together. Um, and whether that's happening in my office or that's happening, you know, in the 10-week NAMI course or that's happening of an individual's own volition of, of educating themselves, um, it, you know, it, it needs to happen. But I also think that it can happen outside the context of care. So one of the things I've been thinking about the last five minutes and, and reflecting on our night together is, you know, again, the messaging, so much of the messaging is about what goes wrong, but here we are talking tonight about what goes well. And we've heard from many people that they're living fulfilling lives and have purpose and have coping skills. And so this event in its own is, an, is its own education. And I hope lives on our Prector mm -hmm. website and people can mm -hmm. watch it. And it's on us as the professionals to make information more accessible to people but also to instill hope for people. The, you know, the stories of people getting diagnosed and immediately feeling like, oh, I'm never gonna graduate college or never gonna, like that needs, that's on us to help make those stigmas go away and Absolutely. have resources yeah. out in the community for anybody to access yep. that instills hope. Wow, phenomenal. Uh, I'm going to open it to, to uh, Ken Adams has uh, raised his hand and uh, wanted to um, comment and, or ask a question. Yeah, I, I, can, I hope you can hear me. We can hear you, yeah. Good. Um, I think that uh, the discussion that uh, Dr. Sperry started with uh, in terms of the uh, polarity between um, finding something wrong or fixing it or whatever is, is really uh, quite an important construct, particularly for older uh, individuals like myself who have been caregivers, um, because that's we, we really have been uh, raised to be kind of like mechanics, to get under the hood and find out what's wrong. Um, and the transition to thinking about wellness has had some blowback uh, to, to some degree. Um, I remember when we first uh, started talking at Michigan Medicine about uh, alternative or complementary treatments, there, there, there was kind of a backlash about that. Well, no, 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 you can't, uh, you can't contemplate doing any of that. And I think that's eased some. But I think, I think the, the one of the central themes of the, the discussion tonight is uh, we have to, we have to change the polarity. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, uh, we have a few minutes, uh, yeah, Eliana uh, Bressler has uh, raised, um, a raised hand, uh, Eliana. Okay, now you can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much for this, this is wonderful. Um, I have a, a close friend, the whole family's friends of us, and their son was diagnosed about five years ago, so my question is, I would First of all, I want to thank, especially this whole thing about measuring wellness as opposed to symptom amelioration, because I have physical disabilities and we go through the same thing. Oh, you look fine. I'm like, yeah, because I'm so drugged, I can't move. Um, so um, I would really like tips on um, how to help somebody accept. I loved what um, the young lady said about um, you have to own it doesn't mean it's going to own you. Yeah. But That's great. Knocking our heads against this poor young man. He, it's everything else. He's in jail now because of his behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's oh, still sorry, yeah, everyone that. else. It's so sad. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. We're reaching the end of our time. And I, and I do appreciate that there are a couple of other people that have their, uh, their hands raised. But just to, for the interest of time, I just wanted to uh, start winding down here. And I'm just going to ask the, uh, the 
panel members just to, for a final word here. And uh, uh, starting with you, Mike, we ended with your introduction. I want to just let you take the lead on the final comment here. Yeah, I just I wanted to, to again mention to the group that you can find a lot of the answers uh, obviously um, on the websites of uh, U of M and uh, NAMI. Uh, and I think the go away from this is that, you know, there is hope. So uh, you're, there is there's hope with coping skills. Uh, we can certainly inform a lot of people, educate people, provide levels of support with support group. And again, these are all things that we all need in addition to medication and in addition to, of course, uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, terrific. Uh, uh, Sarah, final comments from you? Um, thank you for having me. Um, and I, I think that my big message or takeaway for the questions that I felt like were from folks that are trying to support someone is again, remember it's, it's a journey and it's a journey. the hardest learned lesson that I had is remember that you do still in fact need to take care of yourself. <laughs> right. Um, and, and that I will say, I, and one uh, outcome of this whole experience thus far is that I am much better at taking care of myself than I think I ever would have gotten. Um, I've much more tuned into myself. And so that is a, a side benefit that could come. <laughs> Terrific. Wendy. I would say to be, um, gentle with yourself. Self-compassion is really, really important. Um, it's okay to, have days where you're not okay and that um, it will get better and um, that just to to be okay with being gentle with yourself and allowing yourself to that you can um, just be gentle. Terrific. Uh, Jack? Yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Um, I would say uh, in summary for myself, obviously, bipolar is very serious, but if you lean into it and are willing to embrace it, it's also very manageable and you can live a very healthy and good and uh, good life. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sperry, do you want to um, kind of give, a, give an overall summary from your perspective as well? Yeah, I, I just want to reflect on the fact that I feel so honored and lucky to be able to work alongside all of you and helping trying to get this message across. Um, and, and I will end with what I started with, health is more than the absence of disease. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and so we're now just down to the uh, the final minutes here. And I just want to personally thank everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, a big, big, big thank you to the uh, to the panel members uh, for taking the time this evening to join us. And we're so privileged to hear about your experiences and how you've managed uh, with this. And 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 for helping us shine a light forward. And I, I just want to look at, I look at the, the mountain there behind Mike, the, the, you know, the sun is shining on the top of the mountain. So there's, there's sunlight uh, in, 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 in so many ways uh, here. And thank you, Dr. Sperry, for your brilliant presentation and for uh, bringing, taking us through the survey from the DBSA and, and really highlighting for us what they've found and, 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 and the importance of really paying attention to uh, the wellness features of uh, of of life, and and I really thank you for sharing your uh, ideas or your what you do and showing us pictures of your pottery. Brilliant! Uh, I, I didn't know how uh, you know artistic you were. That's really really terrific to see that. And with that, and so it's right at uh, eight thirty. So I thank you all for joining us, and thank you all for sending in your questions and and um, sharing with us the concerns that you have and um, thank you again please visit us on our on the practical bipolar website to follow any information or things that 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 you would like and i also want to highlight again the nami website that that uh, is here in michigan and all the wonderful resources that uh, that there are there we we just love nami and love working with them so thank you all and have a good evening